Hey guys, my name is Josh. I am the co-owner of Genesis Exotics. You can visit us on the web at www.genesisexotics.com and today I'm going to talk to you guys about basic dart frog care. A lot of people think dart frogs are pretty difficult animals to keep. They are in fact easier than crested geckos, gargoyle geckos, ball pythons, and a fish. Believe it or not, easier than a fish tank. You can create their setups to be completely self-cleaning, self-maintaining, which is a big plus. And you can turn their eco, their living ecosystems into one of the most beautiful, vibrant jungle creations that you can dream of. With that being said, their care is pretty straightforward. Since they are from uh, the tropical rainforests, they like their temperature to be between 68 and 76 degrees. Variations of 80 or higher can be handled for an extremely short period of time. Temperatures above 85 will lead to death. Um, typically, uh, they like to be kept in uh, pairs. Some, some of the smaller species can be kept in groups. Uh, you want to make sure that they have a, a night cycle and a day cycle. So you want to make sure you have a 12-hour day cycle and a 12-hour night cycle. So that way they have the proper photo period. Dart frogs like to have very, very high humidity. Like I mentioned, they are from the jungle floor. So they like their humidity to, to be between 80 and 100% at all times. Humidity levels above, uh, excuse me, under 50% for an ex extended period of time will lead to dehydration and then will lead to death at a very quick rate. So to do that, you just want to make sure you're misting their tank every single day. Dart frogs in general eat one simple thing, fruit flies. You can culture the fruit flies yourself or you can buy them from me at my shop at genesisexotics.com and for every culture you purchase, one dollar of it will be donated to the Amphibian Crisis Fund. Alright guys, so what I'm going to cover uh, in more depth are the different types of dart frogs that are commonly available in the market. So the first type I'm going to cover is the Dendrobates tinctorius. These guys are the most commonly available captive-born frogs. Once in a while you can find well-caught imports, but if you don't have a lot of experience under your belt, I would, I would tend to stay away from them. These guys are known for being very bold and very easy, and seem to be a little bit more forgiving to beginning hobbyists. Uh, if you lose track of the temperature or lose uh, track of the humidity, these guys seem to do a little bit better with handling those variations to the novice keeper. Um, these guys are found in Central and South America, um, and they are found on the jungle floor of the rainforest. Um, they uh, eat uh, fruit flies, um, as well as springtails and isopods, and they typically don't get uh, above two and a half inches, which some of your larger locales will get that size. On average, they get about two inches. Um, these guys love to be kept in pairs. Um, typically, females can be a little more aggressive toward each other, especially in the, in the, uh, the Azurias. The one thing that I absolutely love about the Tinctorius is that they are a prime example of evolution and speciation within themselves. So the Dendrobates, that's the species, and the Tinctorius is the genus. And when I mention speciation, what that is, that's when one uh, is when a single population of the same type of animal gets separated from a natural occurrence. A river forms, or there's an earthquake forms a canyon, whatever. Population A and Population B both evolve differently because they're in different settings, creating a completely different locale or type of the exact same frog. So, the thing about the Tinctorius is there are dozens upon dozens of different types of locales available. They're all physiologically the same, but they all look different. They come in yellow, they come in blue, they come in orange, they come in teal, they come in every color of the rainbow that you could want. And they're all this exact same frog, but all found in different parts of Central and South America, which is something that I find to be extremely interesting and something that I feel that every hobby should take in mind when selecting their Tinctorius besides their ease of care. Alright, these are uh, one of the locales that I discussed. These are the Patricia locale from southern Suriname. These are adults. These are one of the pairs that we have at Genesis Exotics. These are one of the most common tinctorious varieties available. Um, they typically morph out at about the size of a dime and are known uh, for, uh, for doing best in pairs and are very, very forgiving to the beginning hobbyist. All right, these are the powder blue tinctorius. These are one of the larger tinctorius that you can get. 
Uh, these guys uh, roughly get about 2.25 inches. They do best in pairs. Um, and one thing I love about them is their variation in color. Um, uh, they have a sister locale called the Powder Gray, which is found about 10 miles away, which is a completely different locale, but looks very, very similar to the Powder Blue. Um, these guys are, uh, are one of the favorite uh, pairs of Tinctorious that we have at Genesis. My favorite, my giant orange Tinctorious. These are one of the largest locales available. They have a sister locale called the Regina, which is an extremely similar locale, but gets a little bit smaller. These guys get about two and a half inches and should be kept in a minimum size of a 20 gallon high. A 29 gallon is recommended for a pair, and these guys are gigantic tinctorious. You want to make sure you have sturdy plants in there, as they will crush almost any small or vining plant that you put in there. One of the rarest low counts of tinctorious that we have here at Genesis is the Kotiari River. These guys were initially imported from understory enterprises and under the canopy um, in the mid-2000s and have since become one of the most popular tinctoriouses available. They are known for being notoriously harder to breed because of their dietary requirements as well as their seasonal breeding tendencies. These guys only get about two and uh, roughly about two inches as adults and are best kept in pairs. All right, this locale is the is the citronella. These guys are found in two different variations. So, uh, one of them will have a spot, which is, uh, and the other ones have no spots. So you can have one citronella that's completely yellow with no black spot on the on the cranial end, or you could have one that has the black spot on the cranial end, which we have Genesis Exotics have. These guys are one of the larger locales that you can get. They roughly get a little over two inches um, and do great in pairs. All right, in here we have a dendro that we have the the Azurius, by far the most popular of all the dart frogs that you can buy. Uh, the big blue frog. These guys get about two inches long. They have a tendency to, to be extremely aggressive toward each other if it's female versus female. So you want to make sure you keep them in pairs and if you keep them in pairs if it turns out to be two girls that that tank is big. At least a 29 for, for, for the two girls that's heavily planted. These guys are from, are from Suriname. And one thing I like about them is they are one of the true examples of speciation. They were actually separated from a river uh, from their close cousins, which I believe are the Powder Blues. And they ended up making their own variable population within that little island itself. Okay, so what else I'm going to talk about is the other types of dart frogs that a lot of people like to start off with. Now, these guys are on the same difficulty level as the Tinctorious, but a lot of them seem to do a little bit better in groups, um, and they also have a tendency uh, to breed a little bit more readily because they like to be in larger groups. And that is our Phyllobates, um, our Dendrobates aratus, and our Dendrobates leucamella. Um, well, the first thing I'm going to start off with, uh, the aratuses have a tendency to be a little bit more shy. They're, they're found in Central and South America. They like to be in large groups. I have found with this species, the more groups you have, the larger group you have, the more, inst the more instincts come out in the vivarium and you'll see them more often. Another extremely good starter frog is the Phyllobates vitatus. These guys are one, of, are one of my favorites because they have a pretty bold call, which sounds a lot like a cardinal. They also do good in groups. They breed extremely easily and are pretty bold in high numbers. If you just have one or two, or three, they might. And here we have our Dendrobates locomellas. These are by far the favorite. They're also called the bumblebee dart frogs. These guys are from all over uh, South America, from uh, from ranges from Venezuela and and all the way west uh, west and southwest down. These guys are do great in groups. Uh, once in a while, you can have some female aggression with egg eating, but as far as physical aggression, you're not really going to notice any of that. They only get about an inch and a half as adults, and the males have a very cheerful call. It sounds very similar to a robin during the springtime. One thing that you're going to notice with this species is males will always try to get to the highest point of the vivarium to call to try to seek out a female. 
These guys are known for being seasonal breeders uh, and are an extremely easy dart frog to start off with. Okay, here we have our Epidobates anthinii. Um, these are this are the Santa Isabel locale. Just like the uh, Dendrobates erratus and Dendrobates tinctorius, these guys have multiple different locales from Zarayunga to Santa Isabel to Highland. These guys come in all shapes and colors. Uh, they typically are one of the smallest dart frogs. They don't really get bigger than an inch. They love to be in groups. Um, you can have a little army of 12 in a, in a 20 gallon high enclosure and they'll do absolutely fantastic. They are known as rabbits in the dart frog world for being extremely easy to breed. They have a great little call um, that I really wish I could point out a sound to it, but once you hear it, you'll, you'll know it's them. Alright guys, and the last group that I'm going to talk about is probably my favorite species uh, and genus of dart frogs, and, and that is the Ratatamia. Uh, the Ratatamia dart frogs are also called thumbnails, and as their name implies, they get the size of the, your thumbnail as adults. I consider them to be an intermediate level dart frog because of their size and speed. Um, they are very, very fast. If you open up your cage, they can, uh, they can hop about 14 inches in a second. Another thing that makes them slightly harder is they're, they are not as forgiving as some of their other dart frog cousins. Um, uh, extreme uh, fluctuations in temperature and humidity will not be tolerated with these guys. Um, and if you do not have an active springtail population in your tank, they will not do well. Springtails are an absolute must for all Ratatamia. Okay, and here we have our Ratatamia vantilinii. These guys are one of the most unique thumbnails in the aspect of they're pretty easy to take care of, they breed pretty readily. These guys were actually illegally imported from Europe. Um, these guys were actually a, a federally protected species. Europe got them in, shipped them into the United States. So almost all of the lines except from understory enterprises were from illegal stock, believe it or not. But now they're so common in the hobby that it's just kind of forgotten about, very similar to the Dendrobates galactinatus. Okay, in here we have the Ranatumia imitator. This is the Shizuda locale. Like the Tinctorius, these guys have many different locales all throughout Peru and South America. These guys typically get the size of a dime, um, or, or some of the larger uh, thumbnails can get the size of, an, of a nickel. Um, these guys are one of the best beginner thumbnails because um, they seem to be a little bit more forgiving and they are a little bit slower than some of their other counterparts. Okay, and, with, and lastly, there are other groups of dart frogs that I like to say are on the expert level. And that is the genus of Ufaga, which, um, which are Pumilio, uh, your Histronicus, uh, in some of your larger obligates. They're called obligates because they actually raise their own babies in a tank for you. So, so the parents will lay eggs and the eggs will turn into a tadpole and then uh, dad will put the tadpole on his back, transport them into the necessary deposition site, uh, and mom will feed the tadpoles with unfertilized eggs until metamorphosis is complete. These frogs do not uh, do not do well in small enclosures. You need a minimum of a 29 gallon for a trio uh, and for your larger obligates you need at least a 24 by 24 by 36 for a pair at the very minimum. They do not tolerate temperature fluctuations, they do not temperature uh, tolerate humidity fluctuations and they must be fed isopods they must be fed springtails and they must be fed a varied diet and they must be supplemented properly or they will not do well.